Welcome to On Record PR, where we go on record with industry leaders to discuss best practices for public relations strategies that drive business success. Let's get started with the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to On Record PR. I'm your host, Gina Rubel, and the founder and CEO of Fiori Rubel Communications. The events of the past two years have reinforced that no business or organization is safe from experiencing a crisis. With the global pandemic, civil unrest, and cyber attacks among these, businesses around the world continue to face crisis-related challenges. As crisis communications experts, we are often asked about the role in-house counsel play when an organization is faced with an incident or impacted by a crisis, perhaps it might even be a global pandemic. Today, we are going on record with Maria Feely, the Chief Legal Officer of Washington and Lee University, to discuss the important role of the General Counsel in times of crisis. As the Chief Legal Officer of Washington and Lee, Maria has successfully managed crises creatively and to achieve the best results for the institution. Washington Lee is a nationally ranked private liberal arts university established in 1749 with an endowment valued at more than $2 billion. Maria previously served as vice president, general counsel, secretary, and for two years as interim athletics director of the University of Hartford and was chief legal officer of Florida A&M University, one of the largest HBCUs in the country. Maria also was a partner in the AMLA 100 firm Pepper Hamilton in Philadelphia, where she chaired the firm's women's initiative, was vice chair of the diversity committee, a member of the hiring and contributions committee, and co-founded the firm's Latinx affinity group. I have known Maria since her days at Pepper Hamilton, when she and I served on the Philadelphia Bar Association's Young Lawyer Board together. So we won't be sharing those stories today. We'll be more talking about her role as in-house counsel. I invite you to learn much more about Maria, her awards, and so many more accomplishments by reading her biography and the transcript on our website. Welcome, Maria. Thank you, and thank you for having me today. It's so great to see you again. As I said, we started out very uh, early in our careers getting to know one another and have been able to uh, stay in touch over the years, even while you traveled all over the place. (laughs) Yeah, I always I'll always be a Philadelphian through and through, and I try really hard to stay connected to Philadelphia and all the great people I've met there, including you. (laughs) And I'll share with our listeners that we just realized after all these years of knowing each other that our fathers taught at the same high school, which was then Bishop not John Newman, which became St. John Newman in South Philadelphia. So what a small world it really is. Yes. And now your dad teaches at my high school alma mater. So, or, or he was teaching it. Is he still there? He passed away about four years ago, Um, but yeah, he was at uh, Newman Goretti uh, after the merger, so he had never taught young ladies before. That was quite the transition for him. (laughs) God bless him. He had no idea what he was in for, did he? (laughs) (laughs) So we're going to talk about crisis communications today, and what I'd like to know is how you define crisis or a define what is a crisis for your institution and some of the types of crises you've had to manage. So in my experiences, crisis and uh, reputational management issues come in all shapes, sizes, and flavors. They each have a unique set of circumstances around them, but they can each have equally devastating (laughs) impact on reputation, brand management, relationships with key stakeholders, um, they can result in an immediate firestorm or, or even, you know, frankly, what can be a more damaging these days is a social media storm. So I've been in various roles. I, I currently chair a college board and have been outside counsel and inside counsel to various institutions from, you know, an elite liberal arts college with a $2 billion plus endowment, a large public HBCU to a college with or university with seven different colleges and you know a 
more modest, under $200 million endowment. And then, you know, I chair the board of a small school that's been around for 100 years, but doesn't have anywhere near those resources. And one thing I've realized is that none of those institutions are immune to crisis. And um, there's so much overlap in the types of situations that they could face um, and, and what they can do to prepare. So, so some examples, you know, at one of the institutions, I was there in my, in my first year with a brand new president. And there was a horrific viral internet story. Um, the hashtag was Justice for Jazzy. I won't go into the horrific details of what one first year student did to another, but Twitter was angry and rightfully so. And we were being tweeted at by, you know, Jesse Williams, Van Jones, Al Sharpton. We were on MSNBC every night for a while. And, you know, that was followed by a Title IX lawsuit. Uh, involving a Division One athlete and coach, which you know gets more attention when you're talking about D1 athletes. Then we had uh, a stabbing on our campus during Accepted Students Day. So not only do we have our normal population, but we had all of the visiting high school seniors and their parents during a lockdown with the police trying to find the perpetrator. Um, we had an NCA investigation and <laughs> negotiated a public resolution, which you can also read about. And then after, while I was the athletic director, the department thrived. We had our men's basketball team's first ever NCA tournament appearance. And as a reward, a few months later, the board voted to... <laughs> go from D1 to D3. So there's now a federal lawsuit pending and, you know, relentless media coverage. So that's, you know, that's just one institution's array of um, issues that you've got to manage. When I was at um, an HBCU, I, I, at my first public board meeting, they fired the first female president in the institution's history a year and a half into her contract. And two days later, most of the cabinet was separated from the institution a few months later, there was a, a shooting at homecoming resulting in, you know, the death of a student followed by a football concussion lawsuit. And then, you know, even at a, the small liberal arts college right outside of Philadelphia that is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year, I oversaw a presidential search where we uh, made a selection to hire the, the first male president in the history of the institution that until 10 or so years ago was all female. So as you can imagine, um, some people understood the decision, but a lot of alums needed some careful attention and communication. So, you know, the array of issues that can come at you and really turn into something that you didn't expect, frankly, within hours. There's a lot of things to think about when you're trying to avoid or successfully manage a crisis. Did you ever think that media relations, social media management, brand management, reputation management would play such a big role in the practice of law? No, I didn't really. You know, being in private practice, I didn't think about it at all. Frankly, it wasn't even on my radar. And then, you know, as you you know move up the ranks in, in a big in big law and you start to deal more directly with the C-level executives um, that you're providing advice to, you start to understand that you can't think of these issues in the vacuum. And it's not just about winning the litigation. You really have to start to understand that for your client, it's the big picture issues. How is it going to impact reputation, brand? How is, is it going to alienate customers? shareholders, other stakeholders. And so it took me a while to, first of all, even have that on my radar. But now um, that's one of the first things I think about as I provide advice to clients. I really appreciate you saying that. And, and to our listeners, this is not scripted. <laughs> but what's fascinating as both lawyers who deal with reputation management, crisis communications, uh, litigation communications, I can't tell you how many lawyers don't appreciate the importance of those issues and don't even have the language of brand management in their repertoire. And so I hope for the lawyers listening to this that you take heed. If you work with corporations, there's so much opportunity to add value to the services you provide as outside counsel by understanding how these issues interplay with Everything from employment law and M&A to renaming or, for example, when you're going through contracting to name a college, you know, we, we've seen that across the board. And so when people ask me, you know, 
why did you leave the practice of law? I never did. I just do it differently. Yeah. You know, and, and that's why we have these types of partnerships and we have these types of conversations. So what should be the GC's or your office's role during, and let's say it's been defined as a crisis, because we also know that there's incidents that aren't really crises. But during a crisis, what's the GC's role and the office's role? Well, hopefully you figured out that out before the crisis. And I think that the main way you figure it out, and frankly, it's not just as a GC, you know, sitting with my board chair hat on as well. I think that whenever you get involved at a, at a high level, C-level position or board level governance position with an institution, you've got to do an assessment first. You've got to figure out what talent is there and who is going to be able to be on the team to successfully navigate through these reputational issues. Because you might inherit a great team with pros that have connections to the media, that uh, know how to talk to media, or you might inherit a very green team. You might have a a first-time president or a first-time board chair, or your PR office might not be local. You might have somebody that just came from another state and they have great contacts in Wisconsin, but they don't have any in Georgia where you might be. So I think assessing your team first is so important because if you don't know everybody's skill set and experience levels going into a crisis, you don't know who's capable of what. And so that's one thing that I recommend doing. Just, you know, taking the temperature of everybody, getting a sense of who is going to be on that team when you're in crisis mode, I think is the first thing that, that a GC or any, any high-level executive should do when they join an organization. You know, I'm curious. So we've handled a lot of crisis matters for various institutions and had them where it was actually board members who caused the crisis. How do you vet for that? I mean, can you even vet for it? You know, it's very interesting to me how different institutions are in terms of how they identify and choose board members. And, you know, most of my experience is in the nonprofit higher education sector. So, you know, corporate's very different and it's frankly changing a lot as you have have places like, you know, direct women trying to help diversify boards. But, you know, in in the higher ed space, I find it's unique to each institution. One of the things that I've tried to do as a board chair is to be much more strategic in identifying people to be on the board and to, frankly, orienting them because they might not know that they're going to create a crisis or they might understand what their role is if you don't frankly train them and orient them and educate them about what it means to be on a board how if if you speak and you purport to be speaking on behalf of an institution you could create a firestorm and how really if you're contacted by the media there's a protocol that should be followed you should not just speak off the cuff and you should know what that protocol is I think that's fantastic to hear. Um, I was on the alumni board at Drexel University, which is my alma mater. And one of the first things they did in board orientation was just those things. You talk about what is your role, yeah. who may or may not speak to the media. I don't think we did any media training because it wasn't anybody's job to speak to the media. Huh? And social media wasn't such a big deal back then. (laughs) I'm dating myself. But it's interesting because it is about training. Do you also train them around a crisis plan and how crises are managed? I do. So because, you know, this has been something that, you know, a subject matter expertise area for me, I find that it is way better to train people or educate people or provide them with information well before they need it <laughs> um, than to be scrambling at the end to try to control your message, to, to decide who's going to be the point of contact for media inquiries. So I do. I have a very, frankly, short orientation for new board members that I like to do because you don't want to 
provide too much information. You want to provide the most important information right away. And for me, one of the most important things is understanding that when you're on a board, you're part of you're part of a governing body. You're you shouldn't go rogue and individually do things. And um, that includes speaking to the media, responding to the media, leaking things to the media. And so that is part of the training that I do with the board that I chair. And when I'm asked to train boards at other institutions, I always incorporate that into training. So we've talked a little bit about a plan, but let's define that a little bit more. When do you create a crisis communications plan? So look, as I indicated earlier, brand reputation issues, crises, they come in all different sizes, shapes, forms. So they do require unique responses to some extent, but there are some things that you can do well in advance before there's a potential, you know, crisis even on your radar. And, you know, so, and I include that as, as that's part of the planning. So from my perspective, there are things that you could do to, to lay the groundwork so that you are well prepared to navigate gate quickly. And this first few hours of a crisis can be critical. So you should already have some things in place so that you're nimble and able to do things quickly. So, so for example, you know, I, I mentioned assessing the team is the first thing that you want to do, but um, building the right relationships early so that you are not picking up the phone to call an external crisis management firm when the crisis has already been going on for a few hours. You should have that relationship now because you want those external partners to already know your your institution, to know the key players, to know your stakeholders, to understand your culture. How are they going to give you quick and really good advice if they don't know you, right? Because you want advice that's narrowly tailored to your institution and your specific situation. So I think building those relationships immediately when you enter into the job is important. And then similarly, you need to build those internal relationships so that you will be a trusted advisor. How could you be a trusted advisor if people don't know you, right? It takes some time to build trust. The other thing I think that is important is to, to figure out, you know, a lot of times the general counsel ends up being the, the central point of contact, particularly if there's anticipated litigation, but that's not always the case. So I think that it's really important to figure out who's going to be, you know, central command. Is it going to be in the GC's office? Is it going to be in your marketing and communications office? Or is it going to be somewhere else because of, you know, who you've got on your team? Identifying that person so that everybody knows who it is before a crisis is really important because you can really get into trouble if you've got the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. And then you can end up having inconsistent messages um, and your strategy won't be um, consistent and on point. So I think those are two things you can do really early on, building those external partnerships, internal relationships, and making sure you know who's going to be on the team and who's going to be take the lead when you're in a situation. They can take a long time to figure those things out. And if you haven't done that before you are in the situation, that can eat up a lot of really valuable time. Well, I think one of the things to add to that, especially for our audience of listeners, which is both, you know, in-house marketers at law firms and lawyers themselves, is to understand when they play a role as well. And depending on the type of crisis is going to really depend on when your outside counsel is going to have a need to be a part of that team. And that's going to be defined in your plan based on the type of crisis. So if it's a cyber breach, for example, you may have your privacy counsel available, somebody who works in, in data security available, but, you know, but you also know that you have to contact your insurance provider first because the cyber policy says that. And then, you know, there's other instances where something might go to litigation or may already be in litigation mm -hmm. where the in-house marketers can be really providing great, when I say not, not just your in-house marketers, but the in-house marketers at your outside counsel, but can be working with your internal teams yeah. to protect the brand. And, that's the one thing I think lacks the most in industry. And I've seen it over and over and over again. It's, I find it interesting because I've noticed that are a lot of big firms are not now starting to create crisis communications yeah. offerings. 
Have you worked with any of them? At big firms? Yes. Yes, but not connected to the law firm. So outsourced by the law firm. Okay. Uh, I do work with a lot of big firms that I trust that the very experienced attorneys have, you know, they've been through this. They, they right. know how to deal with the media. I much prefer to, to have a relationship where even if the main partner at the firm I have doesn't have the subject matter expertise for the particular issue that I'm dealing with, he could have the good judgment and experience to understand the big picture issues Mm -hmm. because you don't have to be a subject matter expertise, for example, in like you mentioned cybersecurity to understand how the social media or the traditional media coverage can go. And that person can partner with your, you know, the crisis communication team that either you select or, or they recommend. And that way you've got somebody else in the loop that also understands your brand, your culture, knows your people. So I tend to always, uh, each firm that I work with have sort of what I call the relationship manager, because I keep that person involved in everything, even when it's not within their subject matter expertise, because they kind of, kind of rein in, frankly, some of their, maybe some of their colleagues that might not get that it's not just about winning, you know, this legal battle. (laughs) There are other issues that might be more important, frankly. Out of curiosity, have you ever asked about prospective counsel's experience in high profile litigation or crisis communications, like on an RFP, for example? So I would, but frankly, because I've been, I've been doing this for a long time and I was at I was in big law for most of my career. I've built my own network. So I don't really go through the RFP process because I want to work with people that I know that I've seen Mm -hmm. tested. Now, if, if I was ever in a situation where I had to do that, I I would, but that's, I think one of the benefits of coming out of big law that you have worked with so many of these people and you've been, you know, against them in many different (laughs) cases that, you know, frankly, that's the highest compliment. You know, I, I often hire people that I've been on the other side of in a courtroom. That is a big compliment. And you, you were supposed to be on at a, a trial today. So you're still actively litigating. So I manage, I manage our outside attorneys. I do not miss the courtroom, Maria, not even a little bit. <laughs> but I'm happy to be here with you today. What a great conversation. Let's take a quick break for a message from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Furia Rubel Communications. Recognized as the number one agency by the National Law Journal, Furia Rubel helps top businesses and law firms with high stakes public relations and marketing, reputation management, crisis planning, and incident response, including high profile litigation media relations. To learn more, go to furiarubel.com or email podcast at furiarubel.com. So what trends are you seeing and how are they impacting your position as as the chief legal officer? So, you know, it's funny. Some trends are unique to the schools that aren't elite that everybody's you know trying to get into because of the prestige factor or because they you know are have a high ranking um, one trend that is in higher ed right now which is frankly wreaking havoc is you know demographic changes so that schools that are largely dependent on tuition revenue for their operating budget are seeing decreased enrollment numbers of traditional age college students. Um, And that has had a ripple effect so that we have seen so many, frankly, closings of colleges and universities throughout the country in a way that we had never seen before and mergers. I mean, they, we just had one, I think, in Philadelphia. Or there, one was announced between, I think, St. Joe's and what was it, University of Sciences? I didn't see that one yet. I know or, that there or Philadelphia was... University. I, I can't remember. I feel terrible for, for whoever what it wasn't. But um... I'll look it up and I'll put in the transcript uh, one of the articles. But there were f- at least five Pennsylvania state schools that have now consolidated. Consolidated. So it's it's happened a lot in Pennsylvania. I wasn't clear if it was a trend here or around the country. It is a national trend, and frankly. 
it's a crisis in throughout the industry because if you are dependent, if you don't have a, if you're not sitting on a multi-billion dollar endowment and you're dependent on tuition revenue and you are seeing a decrease every year and you're still doing things the same way, delivering services the same way with the same amount of staff, I mean, you're not going to survive. So higher ed has really, the mass of higher ed that's not in that small category that has the billions of dollars in the endowment um, has really, you know, had to adjust and is going to have to continue to, to adjust as, you know, there are less students graduating from high school that than there were, you know, just, just by virtue of um, demographics changing. And then you also have a lot of people that don't see the same value. They are getting steered towards different types of careers. They want to take a break. There's a lot more non-traditional age college students that frankly demand to be provided services in a different way. So I do call it a crisis because Look, a crisis is something that can it can bring you down in the end. And I really do think there are a lot of schools that have been completely brought down and there are more that are going to come if they don't adjust. Is it just demographics or and and has the pandemic increased the speed with which this is happening? So this was going on before the pandemic. And I think the pandemic just added a new a new layer, a new wrinkle. You know, you have colleges and universities that were already in fiscal crisis and trying to manage that because of the change in demographics and the enrollment challenges facing most institutions. And then when you add the fact that now a lot of your customer base has decided that they're going to put college off or they want it delivered in a different way in you know, the comfort of their own home and they don't want to pay the same amount as they would have for that in-person experience. It has just compounded a problem that, frankly, was already there. So we know that there's the financial challenges as one of the trends that you're seeing impacting chief legal officers. What about things like mental health and behavioral health issues of, of students, faculty, How's that impacting? So that's been a huge shift as well. I think, you know, years ago, nobody talked about mental health. If they did, there were negative connotations. And that has changed. You know, this this generation of college students understands that mental health is just as important as physical health. And they're frankly demanding attention in that area. They're aware of their own mental health and they want it to be cared for. They want there to be support in place if they need it. You know, if you have a place when somebody gets a cold or a flu that they could go to on campus, they expect the same thing if they're dealing with, um, if they're struggling or dealing with mental health challenges. And frankly, the pandemic has just, I mean, exacerbated the issue because I mean, let's face it. Can you imagine being in school and, you know, you're supposed to graduate and you're going to have these great memories with, you know, your, your class. And then all of a sudden tomorrow the school's shut down and you'll not, you're never going to see some of these people again, or you lose those precious last few months, or you don't get the, the graduation experience, or, you know, you don't get your study abroad experience, or you get your division one hopes ripped away, um, you know, right before a championship game, or, you know, these, these kids have suffered through so many things that nobody would have ever anticipated. And it's challenging. And I think that they've recognized that they need to take care of their mental health. And so they're, they're demanding more as they should from institutions, but it puts institutions in a weird position because a lot of them you know, they, they're not equipped. They don't have the resources. They don't have the funds. And so it's it's a struggle, but it's something that is a hot topic in the industry now. It's not going to go away and schools are going to need to adjust. Oh, it's definitely not going to go away. And as a parent of two college age students, I can tell you, you hit the nail on the head about five times. I have, I mean, I'm just one person or we're just one family, I should say. And Both of our children have been incredibly impacted by the pandemic, whether it was, you know, my son didn't get a senior year in school. He was at home and, you know, our daughter missed a year and a half of college and the opportunity to go to Ghana to study abroad and, you know, which was her dream. And so uh, it's definitely, you know, as a parent, forget as a crisis communications expert, but as a parent, it is 
so important that universities have the resources necessary to help students through all the different adjustments. So if you ever need a parent spokesperson, I'm there. <laughs> and you know, you know, I picked the, I guess the, I don't want to call them nice disappointments, but you've also have, you know, the food insecurity issues caused oh, yeah. by the fact that people have lost their jobs from the pandemic and the, the inability to keep the heat on. I mean, the, the, the inability to stay at college because their parents lost absolutely. their jobs and they didn't have a scholarship. And right. You know, the inability to access because mm -hmm. the community doesn't have the resources, let alone the university. Uh, right. You know, we haven't even talked about, you know, the socioeconomic backgrounds and how yeah. there are such disparities. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, we all have an opportunity and a duty. I was looking for the word duty to help in the, in those regards to whatever extent we can. What about, you know, one of the big things that we've been seeing a lot in the news lately are student outcries against universities, uh, perhaps, and I'm, I'm being careful not to call out any particular university, but perhaps they don't like that an attorney at the firm that they worked with or work with represented somebody that the university students don't like. Have you, I mean, we've been seeing a lot of that recently and in particular as it relates to the 2020 elections. Are you seeing more of that, this free speech and, and academic freedom? And Well, I think frankly, in a good way, our young people are really engaged and really care about issues that maybe wouldn't have been on a lot of students' radars years ago. You know, they are activists, they're engaged in social issues, political issues, and that's a good thing, right? But it can also cause a headache for an institution when they don't like a decision an institution has been made or some of the institutions hired, for example. So it is definitely an issue that a lot of colleges and universities are grappling with these days because I, I think that most colleges and universities would be supportive of their students being engaged citizens. Of course, you know, academic freedom and freedom of speech is something that's a core value for most institutions of higher education. So balancing that with when you have a conflict between your students and maybe your administrators or uh, your board or something else is it can be a real challenge. So one of the things that I have been curious about, and I suspect immigration issues come into play with higher education, with universities, especially now with the pandemic. So for example, my son on his rugby team, there are several people from other countries and some of those countries have now closed their borders again. Do you deal a lot with issues of whether it be first generation college students or traveling students? Mm -hmm. So first generation college students is a huge and, and, and it's fantastic, right? The fact that we have more people having access to education and going to college is a good thing because when you look at the data, the average earnings of somebody over a course of a lifetime that has a college degree are substantially higher than somebody that doesn't. So that's a good thing, but there are challenges that come with serving a population of students that are first-generation college students because they can't call mom or dad and say, how do you do this? Mom and dad don't know because they've never done that before, or maybe they're Maybe there isn't a mom and dad to call. So, you know, making sure that you understand who your students are so that you can provide them the support that they need. And that support might include things that you didn't normally do in the past, including helping them navigate through, for example, the financial aid process in a way that, you know, maybe in the past you assumed that they would do because they weren't first-generation college students and their parents had been through that process before. Um, in terms of the international question, you know, I think it's so country-specific, especially during a pandemic. You know, we've actually here hired a firm, thank goodness, that is a subject matter expert that has bases all over the world in different countries because we um, we have a, a robust travel program for our spring term where we send classes all over the world, frankly, and we want to do it in a, in a way that's safe. So we've hired a firm that 
we can pick up the phone and say, you know, what's going on in the ground in Italy right now? What's going on in the ground in Ghana right now? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that's great about working at a place um, that has, you know, these types of resources that you can afford to do that. But if you're in a smaller place, I think it's very difficult right now navigating through these issues during a global pandemic when, and when, especially when the rules are constantly changing. It's fascinating. I think this is really a key takeaway in this conversation is understanding that crisis communications, crisis, crises come in every shape and size. Mm -hmm. They affect people in so many different ways. No one is immune. And that as the attorney on behalf of your institution, as general counsel with a, a staff of people, you have to recognize how each of these issues interplay with the, the students, the families, the educators, the, the trustees, the donors, you know, I mean, the audience is, is vast and the media and, and the social media critics and so on and so forth. And if your outside counsel can do that as well, that they're going to be bringing a great amount of benefit to you. Absolutely. So I'm going to turn the tides a bit. We've talked a lot about being a general counsel, but one of the things we didn't talk about are some of your passions. And when I read a little bit about you, you were, you chaired a women's initiative. You were the vice chair of a diversity committee. You've been on hiring contributions committee. You co-founded a Latinx affinity group. So what I got from that is uh, that you are very committed to diversity, inclusion, equity, and creating a sense of belonging. How do you encourage that in others? I don't know how I encourage it in others other than doing what I think the right thing to do is and hoping that that message spreads. You know, I find that when you you do something and it works and the result's positive, a lot of times that gets attention and people want to replicate it. So I've been very lucky to have been, you know, mentored by some really great people that when these issues were important to me early on in my career, didn't say things to me like, you should spend all your time billing hours. And so they encouraged me to do those things. So, you know, being involved in the affinity groups from, you know, the time of being a baby lawyer has just been something that has frankly helped, helped me professionally from, you know, dealing with imposter syndrome issues to not feeling like you belong to being able to be in a room where you see others that look like yourself and might have similar backgrounds. That was so important. I think for me to be able to, to make it, to feel like I could continue. And, you know, as a young attorney, you wonder if this is, did you make the right decision? Am I good enough to do this? And then, you know, being able to have those conversations with young attorneys and, seeing them stick around and flourish and get promoted is that it's been so rewarding that I think I don't necessarily actively lobby people to to do the same type of work that I've done but I have noticed that I'll get phone calls asking me you know I noticed that you implemented this at this place or I heard you speak at this event and I think that it happened is for me, at least it's been happening organically and it's been something that I don't know, makes me feel good about the work that I do. So you lead by example. I, I can guess, that's, that about you. I guess that's what I have that done I that about you. Do you have an expectation of the law firms that you work with that they have a strong diversity initiative and not just an initiative, but the numbers to boot? Yeah. So one of the luxuries of being the client now and being a general counsel is I get to be very frank and, you know, big law attorneys appreciate that. And I am very candid. I expect them to try to advance the missions that they all profess to have to, you know, be diverse, inclusive. And when I don't see that on a team, I'm very vocal about it. I think it's harder to do that earlier on in your career. You don't have as much power, but I have buying power now that allows me to have those conversations. And so um, I've made changes based on what I thought was inflexibility or inability to 
deliver on diversity promises. And frankly, I get a better product from outside counsel when they really focus on these issues. I don't understand how you think you're going to give an institution that's very diverse, has diverse constituents, stakeholders, donors, alumni, good advice if it's from a single perspective. And it's shocking to me that people that might not buy into diversity don't at least understand the business case because there really is a business case too. Yes. (laughs) I don't know what else to say, but yes. And you know, you're not the only general counsel that we've spoken to that has said just that. And I hope, if anything, that the executive committees and the hiring committees and the new business committee, I hope they're hearing it. I hope they're hearing it so that we, if we were lucky to come out of law school when there was more, uh, there were many more women and many more uh, people of diverse backgrounds in law school, you know, when we got started. But I didn't know women partners early in my career. There were few and far between. And so there's still few and far between now in big law. (laughs) They are, they are, but we're, we're, we're a lot further than we were then. I think the pandemic has hurt us in that respect, but I guess I've been fortunate to be surrounded by very, strong, well-deserving, leading women, as you will. In, and we can only continue to rise the tides for all diverse people, not just women, but everyone. You and I, I can relate to being female. So that's what I can speak to. But it's, it's but for me, like everything else. From hiring outside counsel, thinking about, for example, when you're, when you're getting ready to try a case and you're thinking about who's going to be in the jury, you know, diversity comes in all sizes, shapes, forms. It's not just about gender or ethnicity. It can be, for example, even age, right? You can have a jury that has, you know, 18, 19, 20 year olds and 75 year olds. And again, if you are providing me with advice through the lens of strictly, you know, I don't know, a 65 year old, um, that's not necessarily going to be the advice that I need. Mm -hmm. So I think the practice of law, it's just a no brainer that understanding a broad perspective and bringing that broad perspective to your advice is is critical to giving the best advice. Well, right down to not just bringing in lawyers from the same five law schools all the time because they've all been taught the same way. And you you and I were talking about growing up in Philadelphia and how, you know, I, I admit I did not know that cowboys were still a real thing when I was a teenager, Mm -hmm. but it was something you saw on TV. Like the perspective of diversity from not just, you know, from where you've grown up, what your life experiences has been, what your age is, what your abilities are, you know, all of those things. Well, and if you only go to those few schools, right, it's self-perpetuating because the opportunity to get there and the path to get there is so for some people, non-existent, and for some people, so much more difficult. And so if you want to have access to that broad group of people, you're going to have to move out of that small group of schools sometimes. Absolutely. And, I, and you know, I think we've given our listeners a lot to think about. I hope you will agree to come and be my guest again. <laughs> At the very least, we're going to have to have a Zoom call more often since I haven't seen you in so long. But before we go, could you tell the listeners if they wanted to reach out, learn more about you or your university, um, how they can do that? Sure. So I'm on LinkedIn, so I'm easy to find there. And I always encourage, look, I'm willing to talk to anybody that wants to talk to me that's in the same profession and that's trying to do the same thing that I'm doing. So I'm happy to connect with people on LinkedIn. If you're in, in-house at a college or university, I'm always happy to connect that way too through NACUA. And, you know, I always say that, you know, people that are willing to do that and mentor and give advice end up getting just as much and learning just as much in the process. So I encourage people to not hesitate at all to reach out. Maria, thank you so much. I'm sure the listeners have enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. And with that, uh, listeners, please 
enjoy. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to me at podcast at furyrubble.com or you can send me a Twitter message to at on record PR and enjoy the day. Thanks, Jean. Thank you. Thank you for listening to On Record PR. Visit our website, onrecordpr.com, to subscribe to the show, share it with your friends on social media, find show notes, additional episodes, and more information. We'll see you next time. In the meantime, feel free to send us questions or show ideas at podcast at onrecordpr.com.